Hello and welcome to this episode of The Cycle Edition. I am Grace Letowski and I'm joined today by Matt Gensink and Wesley Swords. Um, today we have a special guest on our episode, Dr. Jake Yeston, um, who is the physical science research editor of Science Magazine. So welcome to the podcast and thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, so jumping into just, I guess, your background, how did you get into scientific publishing and kind of what did you do through your PhD to get into that track? So I think like a lot of other editors that I've talked to, I fell into this career by accident. Um, not exactly by accident, but what I mean is that I didn't really envision being an editor until that day after my second postdoc when I was looking around at ads in CNE News and it turned out Science was looking for an editor and I thought, oh, I could do that. That sounds really interesting and, you know, the rest is history. But leading up to that point, I was an undergrad at Harvard. I worked with Eric Jacobson. And I went from there to Berkeley, where I worked collaboratively under Bob Bergman and Brad Moore, who were respectively a synthetic organic metallic slash physical organic chemist, that's Bob, and a physical chemist, that's Brad, did mostly gas phase work. And I was on a joint project between them that had been going on for about 10 years by the time I got there to do flash kinetics in liquid noble gases because Bob was known for CH bond activation and originally those reactions were too fast to monitor in hydrocarbon solvent so they had to find something that the metal complex would not react with so that they could track the kinetics of CH bond activation. Those turned out to be uh, liquid krypton and liquid xenon, which I found completely fascinating. I thought, well, that's so interesting. I'm going to get to work with liquid noble gases. It turned out that right around the time that I got there, technology and ultrafast infrared spectroscopy had gotten to the point where they just about could monitor the reaction in pure solvent. That was going on in Charles Harris's group at the time, also at Berkeley, and so I collaborated to some extent with them too. So I was doing both microsecond kinetics and also ultra-fast uh, picosecond kinetics. Okay, I was going to ask that actually. I did my background in nanosecond TA, so I was wondering how fast you were getting on that. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that, th those are exciting times. You know, that was, um, you know, Robin Hochstrasser had really pioneered uh, these ultra-fast IR pulses. And so that down the hall in Charles's group, you know, I was detector limited, right? So okay. my time resolution was based on how fast the indium antimony detector could respond. And they were, of course, pulse limited. So, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. in that situation, your time resolution comes from sending your probe pulse on a little trip. You have a delay stage. And so that gets you from just about a picosecond, maybe less, maybe a few hundred femtoseconds, out to the nanosecond regime. And then there's a step scan procedure uh, that can fill in the in-between regime. But anyway, to make a long story short, I sort of gravitated from thinking about more synthetic chemistry in Bob's group to uh, wanting to learn more about the physical chemistry side, especially because ultrafast IR seemed like a really exciting burgeoning field. And so I moved more from the synthetic toward the physical chemistry direction in my postdocs. Brad had a longstanding collaboration with Carl Kampa, who worked at the Max Planck Institute outside of Munich. And when I was a fourth year in graduate school, Brad said, you know, you're interested in ultrafast IR. We really ought to set you up with Carl because he's looking for a synthetic chemist to do a project. And so I went out to Germany for about a month and I met the folks there and it was great and I came back and I said yes I really want to do a postdoc there and so um, I applied for Humboldt Fellowship and I got the Humboldt Fellowship I, I went over there and had a fantastic time really learning a lot about laser science and ultra fast ultrafast kinetics. And then from there I did another laser postdoc with Ted Heilweil at NIST which was in Maryland and so then it was around 2004 and I had finished my postdoc at NIST and for various reasons I was geographically constrained you know I had family reasons that I, I wanted to stay in the DC area and so I started looking for jobs specifically in the DC area and you know it's pretty hard to do an academic search if you're that geographically constrained and there wasn't a lot of chemical industry right in DC there's a lot of biotech but I wasn't really a biologist and probably the closest would have been you know to go up to Delaware for DuPont but that seemed like a long commute and so I just started looking for what's in DC and Science Magazine said they were looking for an editor and I thought well you know that would be a great career for me because I've been always half a synthetic chemist and half a physical chemist and I've always felt like I learned how to help those two sides communicate. You know, I had meetings between Bob and Brad who had, they were both 
incredibly intelligent, deep thinkers, but they had very different frameworks for how they thought about experiments. And sitting with them and talking to them and, and trying to bridge that worldview gap, in a sense, between how physical chemists think about experiments and how synthetic chemists think about experiments, I realized that I might be good at that, at helping people to write papers in a way that they could communicate to people in a slightly different subdiscipline. And science, I thought, was an even better opportunity because you know I would help chemists to talk to biologists, to talk to geologists, and so forth. And so I went and I interviewed for the job, and they also were excited that I had been in Germany because they were always looking to expand the international reach of the journal. There's a little bit of a reputation where nature is thought of as more of a European journal, science is thought of as more of an American journal just because they're respectively based in London and in DC. And so they thought it was great that I knew a lot of people in the German chemistry community. So I started there in 2004 and I've been there ever since and it's been a really terrific experience. I say to a lot of people that you know, when you're an editor, you have to learn to take vicarious pride. So I think some people would really miss being at the lab bench and pushing the frontiers forward themselves, you know, through the work of their own hands. And for me, I'm very comfortable basking in reflected glory, so to speak, you know, feeling like I helped people who were doing really exciting work to communicate that work to the wider public. So you kind of like started talking about what it means to be a science editor, um, helping people write their papers, essentially. What does your day-to-day -day look like? What are, you, what are you doing as a science editor? I read a ton of papers. I, you know, you have to really like reading papers, right? Now, it's great to be an editor at science because all of the papers that you read are great, right? And I mean that literally. I mean, we reject a huge number of papers, but most of the papers we reject are also really good. You know, when I went to interview for the job, I had had a paper accepted. That was very early on in my graduate career. I wasn't certainly the driving force for that paper. I was fortunate to do a last minute experiment that got me on the list. And then when I was a postdoc, we sent a, a paper to science that I had worked on quite centrally. It got rejected. And when I interviewed for the job, they said to me, well, it's much more important that you had your paper rejected because you need to know how it feels <laughs> being on the other end. But um, Completely seriously, so many of the papers that we get are outstanding, and it's unfortunate that we can't take more. I'll a little later go into why we constrain how many papers we take. But basically the bottom line is most of my time is spent reading papers. I read papers that are assigned to me. I read papers that are assigned to other people. Um, now that I supervise the whole physical sciences team, I look at an even larger number of papers because sometimes the astronomy editor will circulate me a paper, not because I know astronomy, but because he's asking me a question like, what do you think about this explanation for how they're archiving the data? Or how are we going to negotiate that with them to release their code? things like that. Um, I see a lot of physics papers that overlap in optics. I see a lot of biochemistry papers that involve enzyme kinetics, for instance. And I also read a lot of the chemistry literature. You know, I, I look at papers that are cited in papers I'm reading. I look at papers that might have bearing on the papers that I'm reading. Most importantly, when I'm looking for reviewers, I sometimes read those reviewers' papers to see how similar they are to papers that I'm considering. So as I said, you know, most of the time I'm spending reading papers, whether they're papers that I do most of the assignments actually. So I give some papers to myself and I divvy up the other papers to other editors. Um, I also spend a lot of time looking for reviewers. And it's much easier now that there's a World Wide Web. You know, before I got to science in the 90s and the 80s, it was a much harder job. You used to have to call people on the phone and say, do you know a professor who does X, Y, Z? So I think it's much more democratic now. And students are wonderful because they fill websites with enormous amounts of information about what their group is doing. And so that helps find experts in any given subfield. And so, you know, I spend a lot of time looking for reviewers. That's also informed by conferences I attend, lab visits I go on, where I take notes on what people are doing so that then I think, oh, she's doing this kind of chemistry that I know we're getting a lot of papers in. I'm going to make sure to ask her to review sometime in the near future, that sort of thing. I even tell people when I meet them, I say, you know, it's been great talking to you. When I send you an email in a couple months asking to review, remember that we had this nice conversation. And then, of course, I spend some time editing. 
I, I mark up papers when we decide that we're going to pursue revision to try to make them clearer and to try to clarify or mediate some of the comments the reviewers have made. And more generally, just to make sure that in my mind, the authors are presenting a case that is clear cut and thorough. And if there are things that seem amiss or things that I feel like they're missing, then I query them. I say, you know, is this something that you could make clear? Why didn't you do this or that experiment? So it's not exactly a peer review, but it's, I like to say that, you know, I think unfortunately a lot of students will sometimes read a paper and they'll think, I wish I was smarter because then I could understand this paper. And the truth is, it's just that the paper is not well written. And so I like to think that I boost a lot of graduate students' self-esteem because I, I'm comfortable, I'm in a position where I can ask the author what the student might think is, is a dumb question. I can say, look, why did you say this? Did you actually mean that? And very often the authors will be excited that I ask them to clarify it because it's helping them to convey their work clearly. So that's interesting because the articles in science are supposed to be for a more general audience than say a, a Jax article or an Angamont article would be. So it sounds like you spend a good amount of time trying to do that for a lot yeah, of these articles. Absolutely. And you know, it's a challenge, right? Because you don't want to dumb them down. I mean, you, you want to make sure that the science is being communicated precisely and accurately, but you also want to try to make it accessible. And, you know, ideally, I think Jack's paper should be accessible too. It's just a question of how many hours there are in the day to, yeah. to spend on that. But my hope is that if I'm doing a good job, I'm helping people when they write a science paper to then think of some of the same questions I've raised when they write their next Jack's paper and, and hopefully make that clearer too. And it's even simple things, right? I mean, periodically, you know, sometimes something will happen where midway through the paper, they'll start using a different solvent. And as we just heard, some of the other students in, in Teshik's group were talking about the um, large effect that a solvent switch can have. Or, you know, in this case, maybe they were using a sodium salt, they started using a potassium salt. And I'll say, you know, was there a reason for this switch? And sometimes the reason is, well, we just had more of the potassium salt on the bench or something like that. But things like that, that people write in a paper and they don't think about how significant they might be, right? And so I query things like that. And I say, was there a reason for this? Did you think about whether it was having an effect on your reaction? And I ask people questions about whether when they're, when they're talking about how they did a kinetics experiment, for example, do they have an error margin on those rate constants? How did they determine that error margin? And it's something that they've probably done, but maybe they didn't include it in the paper because it was something that they thought could be included somewhere deep in the supplement, but maybe shouldn't be in the main text, or maybe they didn't think that it mattered all that much because they weren't making a direct comparison. But things like that, I, I think, really help make the paper both more rigorous and I, I think easier to read in a sense because you don't suddenly stop and think why did that change or you know how should I think about this or that aspect of the of the presentation. So you mentioned leading a team that helps you with the editing process. Where does a beginning like PhD graduate start at science or like where do they start and work their way up to? Like what is that process? So, <laughs> almost all of the editors that we hire have postdoc experience. And that I would say is the biggest challenge when people ask me, what should I do to prepare for a career as an editor? And I think as I said, it's a very hard question to answer because what we're really looking for is we're looking for people with a very broad background, right? Like I said, I had experience in synthetic chemistry, I had experience in physical chemistry. And that's why I think it's easier for somebody to decide at a late stage that they want to be an editor because it's hard to commit to a postdoc in a field different from what you've done in graduate school purely for the sake of being an editor. Right, because research is hard and it's demanding and you don't want to go and put yourself through that for two years and try to do those experiments just so that you can then go and read papers, right? You want to really believe in what you're doing. You want to be interested in it. And so that's why, you know, as I said, it's a little bit hard to say this is the path you should take. I think I would hope that what ends up happening is that you're interested in one thing, you're also interested in something else, you 
really immerse yourself in both of those fields and then maybe you come out and you say, okay, you know, now I'm thinking maybe I want to be an editor, but of course it's possible that at that point there won't be an editor an editorial position open. So it's a hard career to prepare for in that respect. It's a relatively flat hierarchy. So most of the editors on staff do the same thing. We don't have that many. We have about 25 editors total. And so we'll have, you know, an astronomy editor. We have two physics editors, one of whom focuses more on optics, the other focuses more on condensed matter, superconductors, things like that. Um, we have a climate editor who focuses on climate science, earth and, at earth and atmospheric. Um, we have more of a geoscience editor who focuses on geology, seismology, things like that. You know, my old boss, Brooks Hansen, who used to be the supervisory physical sciences editor, the position that I have now, he used to say that your job at science is really to represent your community. So what you are doing is, I am the advocate there for molecular chemists, right? I'm there to say, I want to make sure that organic chemistry, physical chemistry, electrochemistry get their best work represented in our interdisciplinary forum. And I want to be accountable to the community. I want to make sure that when I meet people who are chemists, they say, you're publishing the right stuff. You know, not in a narrow sense of thank you for taking my paper, or if you had taken my paper, then I would respect you, but more you're publishing a slice of what my community does that I think is representative of the best work in my community. And that's what I think we all try to do. Let me just add really quickly, I, I mentioned this earlier, why it is that we can't publish more papers, right? I, one of the things that I, I make a point of saying, and I, I still think this, right? I think that the great majority of really good chemistry gets published in Jackson on Gavante. I mean, we're talking about two journals that between them publish on the order of 6,000 papers a year. That's a lot of papers, right? Science maybe publishes 80 to 100 chemistry papers, and that's even some of those you might look at and say, is that really chemistry or is it more material science, right? And then you have other journals. I mean, obviously, there's all of the subdisciplinary journals, right? And there's a lot of good chemistry that gets published there too, right? You know, I don't want to understate that. You know, Journal of Physical Chemistry obviously pu publishes a lot of great work, and then there's organometallics, and of course, all of the other Wiley journals, you know, the, the uh, European journal and, and chemistry and Asian journal and, and all of those. But I think realistically what we're trying to do is we're not trying to take, I mean in principle maybe we are, but in practice we are not taking the 60 very best papers out of Jackson on Gavanta and publishing them in science. Even if we tried our very best to do that we wouldn't do it because number one some of those papers aren't going to get submitted. And number two, the peer review process is obviously imperfect at that, at that degree of precision. So really what we're doing is we're trying to present a slice, right? We're trying to say we publish some of the very best chemistry. And the reason that we want to do that is that we want biologists, we want astronomers, we want geologists who are reading this news, this magazine who are reading this magazine every week. We want to expose them to some of the best chemistry because they're not going to take the time to read Jacks every week, right? But maybe we'll get them to read science, right? And so that's why we have about 15 papers because we don't want people to say, oh, I don't have time. I have to just focus on my own field. I can't look at this. We say, look, make time to look at 15 papers. That's all we're asking. You, it's a thin magazine. You can carry it around on the train or it's on your tablet. You know, you can look at it on your tablet. Take the time to at least look at the titles of these 15 papers so that you as a practicing scientist in discipline A know what's exciting in discipline B. And the way that we do that is we ask experts to help us. Right? So we go and we say to peer reviewers, do you think this paper is the kind of really exciting paper in chemistry that a biologist should be stopping and taking a look at? Now, obviously, the cultural role of science has morphed from there into more of a reward, in a sense. 
in the sense of, you know, when people are evaluating how successful you've been, they think, well, if you've published a science paper, that means you're more successful maybe than someone who hasn't. And obviously, to some extent, maybe our prestige benefits from that, but that isn't our goal. It's certainly not my goal. You know, my goal isn't to figure out who's the top professor at your university. My goal is to try to figure out what's a really interesting paper from anybody to share with the whole scientific community. And so I think it's a little unfortunate that that goal has been distorted in a sense to there, there's a notion that we are rewarding the very top and we're making a decision that speaks for the whole community. So we're almost laying hands on someone and saying, you know, you're at the top. And for better or worse, that's certainly not how I see my job. I think that there's, as I said at the beginning, a huge amount of outstanding chemistry that does not get published in science. And my goal is just to represent some segment of that. Mm -hmm. So you've touched on this a little bit, but what role do you think science has in, we'll say, fostering communication between different fields of science? That's our top goal. That absolutely, that is our mission. Okay. And it's always been our mission. So that's precisely what we hope to do when we succeed, is to foster collaborations, right? To get somebody in another field to look at a paper and to think, I could use that technique. I could use that insight. I could start a collaboration. I could write somebody an email and I could say, you know, that's the missing piece to what we're trying to do. Or even just talk to my students or in, in the case of the students reading the paper to talk to the advisor and say, you know, this is something that will change the trajectory of our project in ways that we didn't think about before. And again, in an out of the box sense, in a sense, not of, oh, this is an optimization for our reaction, but more, this is a different way of thinking about our reaction, or this is even a different way of thinking about what we're trying to measure in our experiment. And I think, I think science and nature are unique in that way because we try to encourage that kind of cross-disciplinary discussion and collaboration at a time when it's more and more important, right? I think science now is becoming more and more interdisciplinary than it ever was, right? People are thinking about their projects in a more far-reaching, interconnected way, especially as techniques honed in one discipline are being brought to bear in another. So clearly, like different scientists and different chemists value different things in their chemistry. Some really value creativity and some, you know, are more towards utility in the pharmaceutical industry or, you know, in whatever sense. Right. For you and maybe for you as a science editor, what are you looking for in truly translational research? That's a very hard question, yeah. as you said, <laughs> right? So... One of the things about the Denton paper that you guys all covered last time, right, was that it was multifaceted in that respect. And I think it's a very rare example of that, where that redox neutral approach was really creative out of the box, but it was also applied to a workhorse reaction, right? So in that respect, I, I thought that paper was really exciting because of that synergy. But obviously, as you've said, that's not always going to happen, you know, and we need to publish a lot of papers. And so we can't just keep waiting until something checks those two boxes. And, you know, obviously someone could come along and say something about that paper that they think is, you know, less practical or what, what have you. And so I think, again, you know, what we really try to do is we try to essentially ask the community to give us input and to say, is this something that you think will push the ball down the field in one of those two ways? And I think sometimes there will be an optimization that people will say, well, this is incremental, except it's incremental in such an important way that we think it's worth publishing in science. 
Or on the flip side, they'll say, this is such a creative new way of thinking about something that even though it hasn't gotten us there yet, it, it's something that, that's worth, worth putting forward. I think in that latter category, you're seeing some of these automation and predictive approaches, right? I mean, we don't yet have a machine that can just do any reaction you want to tell it to do. But I think there are people pushing the boundaries in that direction where what you're looking for is you're looking for how do we solve these problems that get us closer to the threshold of essentially multifaceted automation. In terms of on the, the other side of what's a technological advance, right? I think the best example in that case is, is batteries, right? And thank God John Goodenough was still alive to get the prize. I mean, it's. I hope that I'm alive. I doubt I will be, but I hope that I'm alive when they release those Nobel deliberations so we can find out what they were waiting for because it was just ridiculous how long that took. But, you know, you look at something like the lithium battery, right, which is in the phones and the computers and cars everywhere, right? So, what does it mean that we're publishing papers about lithium batteries, right? What, what is the scientific advance there? And of course, that is still a very ripe area of scientific inquiry because even though they are almost ubiquitous products, there are a lot of grounds for improvement. And in a, both in a technological sense and in an outside the box, how do we think about getting to the point where we can have a viable lithium air battery or you know changing the electrolyte things like that in in ways that maybe will not just not just improve the performance nominally but set off future optimization on a different trajectory and so those are papers that i think are evaluated more on the basis of technological benchmarks than some papers that are you know for instance the organic chemistry automation I talked about before, where that field is in a much more nascent state and, and we're looking more for a big picture, getting to the point where we can start to think about um, technological optimization. So you get in probably hundreds of papers a day, a week, I'm not sure. Um, how do you decide which one is science worthy? Like... We have a really diligent advisory board and we don't like to talk too much about who's on the advisory board because we don't want people to bother them because you know we bother them enough and we don't want people to start independently emailing them and saying oh you're on the science advisory board could you help us mm -hmm. but um, we send each of them probably about five papers a week um, and they send us quick responses that we don't ask them to review the paper what we ask them is if this is technically right, do you think it's exciting enough? And they will then, you know, try to give us input. And that helps us to, because obviously we're not practicing scientists anymore. So even though we read a lot, we might not know, you know, at the frontiers what people think is really exciting or maybe what's precedented. Um, and so that's immensely helpful. And we have, um, I think around 200 people, obviously not just in chemistry, you know, in all of the different fields that we cover, who are immensely helpful in that respect. And we also ask them to give us suggestions of who good reviewers might be. We're always looking to refresh our reviewer pool and especially to make our reviewer pool more diverse. That's something that in the last couple of years we're trying really hard to do so that, you know, we're not relying on the sort of old boys network, so to speak, to keep vetting the papers. We want to bring in new points of view, diverse points of view, um, obviously in terms of gender and uh, ethnic background and also geographic and, and things like that. You know, we, we want to make sure that we're, we're getting points of view from the entire community and not just a small subset of the community that nominally looks prestigious on paper. I think the other thing that we do is we rely on how past papers have been received. And so if we get knocked for taking a paper that has some flaw, you know, then we think about, okay, you know, was that a valid critique? And if so, should we be reading this next paper with that critique in mind? Should we be thinking about who made that valid critique and how we can reach out to them and their community 
to make sure that future papers uh, are maybe improved in that direction. So we've got about 10 minutes left, and um, there's definitely something that Grace, Matt, and I really wanted to touch on, okay. um, and that is the Chem Archive. Um, yeah. and just kind of archive journals in general. We mm -hmm. know that, that's, that these archives have kind of been around for physics and biology for a while, right. but only in the past couple of years has the Chem Archive you know, kind, kind of been built up, and only I think it's been like really this year where we've seen Nature and Science start publishing journals that have been on the Chem Archive. Um, the one that we've discussed recently is Rob Knowles' deracemization paper that we right. saw it was probably almost a year ago in, yeah. on the Chem Archive, and so... I don't think it was that long. Maybe, yeah, maybe six months or something months, like that. Yeah. It might have been earlier this year, I think, yeah. yeah. So to kind of start maybe to get your view on the archive, as well as um, do you see it playing a role in kind of the articles that science might be looking at? Marshall going to listen to this? <laughs> I, I guess he is, right? We, we can't lock him, we can't, we can't lock him out or anything, right? Uh, all right. Um, so, you know, the first thing I, I want to make absolutely clear that science has a long history of respecting archive posting, and we've considered papers that were posted on the original archive. Um, for a long time, certainly since I've been there, that hasn't been regarded as compromising. And so, you know, no one should feel that if they put their paper up on the archive, that's going to compromise its consideration at science. In terms of what I think about it, I think that there are pros and cons to it. You know, I think, I think in principle, it's good because, number one, it's very democratic, right? So if you are in a place, in, whether in a country or at, a, at an institution that maybe doesn't garner a lot of prestige, it's nice to be able to put your paper up without having to fight a regrettable bias that will say, well, you know, as a reviewer, I'm either consciously or unconsciously not going to take your paper that seriously because I don't know who you are or, or I don't really respect where you're from, right? So that's a very good thing, right? I think the idea that you're putting your paper in a forum and nobody's going to try to keep you from doing that, and it's a respectable forum, right? It's not that you're you know, putting your paper just up on your website. That I think is really good. The second thing that I think is really good is that in principle, it's going to bring a lot of eyeballs to your paper and thereby detect some problems that a small subset of reviewers might otherwise miss. And so, as I said, in principle, that's also good, right? Because, you know, the idea is people are going to look at it and they're going to really dig into it and they're going to really figure out if there's something wrong. Both those things are really good. I think that there are a couple downsides too, right? One of the downsides is that you're putting it in a public forum before it's gotten a close read by external experts. Now, maybe that's not the case, right? Maybe before you put it up on archive, you've actually emailed it to a few colleagues and you've said, could you please give this a close read? And they have given you feedback. but. The worry there is that, you know, something's going to go up and people who aren't necessarily experts are going to take it at face value when maybe they shouldn't. Now, I want to be clear, right, that when I say that, somebody is inevitably going to find a paper in science and say, well, you said this was vetted and obviously it was wrong, right? And so I, the, I'm making more of a theoretical point right now which is that I think there are cases where, at least in principle, the justification for peer review is that at least some experts have given it a very close look. And it's my job to make sure that that close look was a close enough look. And I'm not a perfect person, and sometimes I fail in that job. but. It's my goal. And so I think if people understand that a preprint is not that, then it's fine. But what inevitably happens, especially with something like Chem Archive, which is kind of new, is that people don't necessarily do that because they think, oh, it's up. That means 
it's probably right. And so I think that trying to work out, especially with respect to press coverage, you know, the difference between a study that's been peer reviewed and a study that hasn't is something that, that we need to think about and that we need to be a little careful with. As I said, you know, I'm not trying to be turf protective here, right? I'm not talking about we do a better job and so forth. I'm talking more in principle in terms of there is in principle great value in applying peer review and I think that the nominal value of this crowdsourced peer review with respect to a preprint doesn't happen often enough relative to the general value of getting two or three people to look at something really carefully. And as I said, there are, of course, going to be exceptions in both cases. So I think that if there is a, an understanding that a preprint is preliminary and that it is in a, in a situation where there's grounds for improvement and that's in part why the authors put it there, right, then I think that's good. You know, the other thing, again, is I think that there's a question of, you know, when, when I was in graduate school, when I first started in graduate school, Bob Bergman said, you all have to subscribe to Jax because you should read Jax every week. And, you know, of course, I mentioned that I was going to talk about this before. You know, my apartment was about the size of this room, right? And the jacks started piling up. And I got inorganic chemistry and organometallics too. And, you know, pretty soon my apartment was just this maze full of journals. You know, there was the yellow inorganic chemistry and the light blue organometallics. And Jax was that weird kind of grayish green color. And, and it was just towers and towers, right? But I think that there is real utility in reading Jax every week. Right, because it's giving you a snapshot of what is generally construed as really good chemistry across the board. What I hope is that that continues because I think that JAX and Chem Archive are not exactly the same, right? I think in the long run, they're trying to do two different things. And so, you know, I, I think trying to look at what the community as a whole has vetted and regarded as generally significant in the field right now versus everything that everybody's put up are, are, are two different things. And, and I think that they need to be thought of differently. But again, as I said at the beginning, I think Chem Archive is good for all of the reasons that I said it was good. The last thing that I will say is that I think the business models for how preprint servers work are confusing. I don't know in the long run if our business model is, is good or bad. I don't really want to weigh in on that, but it's at least clear cut, right? Our business model is we run a journal and you pay us to read the journal, right? It's much less clear to me exactly what the business model is for a preprint server because essentially people are posting for free, people are reading for free. And so how do you, you know, is it charitable, right? Is, is it philanthropic in a sense or is there some, something else going on? And as I said, I, that isn't a criticism. It, it's just, I, I think that's a question that, that needs to be figured out in the long run. And obviously, Paul Ginsparg has been running Archive for a long time, and he gets donations, and, and you know, I think a lot of libraries help support it. And, and so there are ways to do it. But it, it seems at, at a time when publishing models and sustainably funding journals is a constant conversation. It's strange to me that part of that conversation is not directed toward how you sustain a preprint server in the long run. I think that's 
a little bit of a missing part of the conversation that needs to be included when we talk about you know how much it costs to run a journal versus how much it costs to run a server. Thank you. That's actually, we've just had a lot of discussion on that. So we hope that that may become a, a continuing theme as we go through a lot of these interviews. It's just kind of getting a, a broad sense of like what the field is kind of seeing as these archives are. Let, let me just add at the end, because I made a joke at the beginning, that I do think Marshall is doing an outstanding job. I mean, he is, he is really a committed evangelist, and he has put Chem Archive on the map to the community in a way that really impresses me. And so I just want to give him his due. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's been really fun to kind of follow that entire growth of Chem Archive as it's been released. Like we've really enjoyed kind of following what's been happening there. So um, with that, um, we'd like to kind of broaden back out just really quick to wrap up with yeah. you. And kind of th there were two questions we kind of had for that, which was one, what are some of your favorite science papers that have just in general been published or maybe within the last few years? And then also kind of just do you have any general ideas or just thoughts that you have had on where you think publishing in science is going in terms of like chemistry? Like what fields do you think we'll see in the next like five to ten years? All right. So I thought a lot about your first question, right? Because it's kind of like, which one is your favorite kid, right? And, you know, I have two kids and it's hard to answer that question because I have more than two science papers. But I have an answer that I want to give you because I've got a captive audience of organic chemists right now. And I want to say you should all go read one of the first papers that I handled at Science. It's called The Roaming Atom. And it was published in 2004 by Dave Townsend and Arthur Suits and Joel Bowman and a few more collaborators. And it's a really, really interesting paper. And it's physical chemistry, but it's organic in the sense that they're looking at formaldehyde dissociation. And formaldehyde is an organic molecule. And <laughs> it, it's about transition states and lack of transition states. And organic chemists think about transition states. And so what this paper is about is it's about a trajectory they discovered in formaldehyde photolysis that doesn't go through a traditional transition state, which is a fascinating result when, when you think that that came out in 2004 after you know just about a century of how people think about reaction trajectories going through that saddle point. And what they show is that you're making H2 and CO, and there's this one pathway where what happens is that the H atom nearly breaks off as if you're going to get, instead of making H2 and CO, you're going to get H and HCO. And it, uh, that's why it's called the roaming atom. It kind of roams around. And before it leaves, it abstracts the second H. And that's basically completely distinct from the way that we usually, as I said, think about reactions going over a discrete and well-defined barrier. And it opened up a field in reaction dynamics that turned out to be quite fruitful. There have been reviews now written about it. But as I said, I, I think it was really interesting because it was pathbreaking. And it's the kind of paper that I think you want people outside the gas phase chemical dynamics community to take a look at because it, it makes them think about chemistry in a different way. So 2004, um, go take a look. All of our papers that are more than a year old are free. And so you um, don't even have to have a subscription. Um, so that's my answer to the first question. And um, you know, I already said before, I like the Mitsunobu paper for the reasons that you said. And uh, you know, the C18 was also really interesting um, you know, because they, it was a fascinating um, illustration of what you can do with probe microscopy. Um, but, uh, you know, we publish a lot of really good papers, and I try not to play favorites because I get myself in trouble. And, you know, often I really like a paper that we don't take, right? I'm not the reviewer, and sometimes, you know, there'll be a paper that I really like that the reviewers aren't as keen on, and sometimes then I'll go and try to highlight it, you know, and so... In terms of the second question, where science is going, what I will say is that when I come on a lab visit, that's not for me to say, right? My goal in coming to great places like Wisconsin is to hear how the students and faculty who I meet are gonna answer that question for me. And so I will leave it there. Um, you, can, you can look at what I said back in my December CE News interview with Lauren Wolf, but um, you know, as I said, for the most part, my job is to learn not to prognosticate. 
Awesome. Well, thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to meet with us and discuss a lot of these. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. And um, thank you for all of your hard work. As I told you at the beginning, maybe I didn't say this while I was being recorded, but I think that what you've done so far is fantastic. And um, I only regret that I didn't provide you with good illustration opportunities because I think Grace is very talented. And so um, maybe maybe you'll, you'll figure out a, a creative way to illustrate this, but um, I look forward to seeing and hearing about it later. Thank you so much. <laughs>